Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are going to embark on our final topic for Unit 1, entitled the Intermediate Value Theorem. It's been a pretty long unit. Unit 1 is one of the longer units on all of Advanced Placement Calculus AB or BC, and we finally can come to a conclusion here and start tying up a lot of our uh, loose ends as we perhaps prepare for our unit exam. So. Without further ado, we're going to get right into what this intermediate value theorem is all about. And basically what it is, is an existence theorem. There are three very important existence theorems all throughout calculus, and this is the first that you're going to experience. And it says basically that if f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and k is any number that lies between f of a and f of b, there is at least one number c in that interval a, b, such that f of c is k. That sounds like a lot of alphabet soup right now, I'm sure. But if we look at it visually, it might make a little bit more sense. It talks about the fact that the function f is continuous on some closed interval. So if we look at the first picture here, we can see this closed interval starting at a, ending at b, and a function that's nice and continuous with no breaks, holes, or asymptotes. k is defined to be any number that's between the f of a and f of b. So we have to resign ourselves to the fact that k is a y value, just like f of a and f of b are y values. What the theorem is saying is that there has to be at least one number c, and there could be more, but there's going to be at least one number c that's on the x-axis that lies between a and b, such that the y value at the c is equal to the k. And from this picture, there are actually three different c's. They call c1, c2, and c3. Now, there doesn't have to be three of them, but we know that the theorem guarantees that there would be at least one of them. Okay. Now, it's a very important situation that we understand that this theorem has a condition. For instance, if we look at the second graph and we see the setup, okay, we've got our closed interval a to b, and then we have this k that does seem to lie between f of a and f of b. And I start kind of driving along this graph, this road, and I'm like, whoa, there is no c value, right? Where is the c value such that f of c is equal to f of uh, f of c is equal to k? And it turns out that there is no c value. Well, doesn't that kind of contradict the theorem? And it doesn't. And the reason is because the graph in the second picture is not continuous. And it's very important that we know that that function is continuous. In fact, one of the things that you may have to do on a test is to say that that function is continuous. Now, later on, they're gonna give you some other words to describe the function that will infer that the function's continuous, and that's coming up later. So you don't really have to worry about that so much right now. Now, I wanna to try to give you guys another way to think about this theorem that might put it in a little bit better perspective. So let's picture a situation here. Let's picture that there is a road. And this road is called Highway 267, for lack of a better name. And there are three towns that are situated right along this road. We have Plainfield to the south. We have Avon right in the middle there. And then up north, we have Brownsburg. Think about this theorem as saying this. If you are driving from Plainfield, so you're going to start here. Plainfield is your starting place, and you have to continuously stay on Highway 267, and you're going to drive to Brownsburg, so you're going to continuously stay on 267, starting at Plainfield, ending at Brownsburg, what must happen? And that thing that must happen is that you have to pass through Avon. Right? And that's really what the intermediate value theorem is saying. And this idea about continuity, why do we have to be continuous? Well, let's say that you're driving from Plainfield and aliens abduct you and your car is sort of beamed up to their spaceship and then the spaceship flies over Avon and then drops the car back in Brownsburg. Well, 
that's not going to happen. A, it's kind of ridiculous, right? And B, that kind of violates the fact that this isn't a continuous situation. By continuous, we kind of mean that the wheels of your car or your bike or whatever are always on the road highway 267. So if you ever feel like you're getting a little bit confused by what the intermediate value theorem is saying, think about a situation like this. So if we go back and look at our first example here, it says the function f of x is continuous on the closed interval negative 3, 9 with f of 3 equal to 0 and f of 9 equal to negative 12. Which of the following would be a correct statement concerning the existence of a value c by the intermediate value theorem for the function f of x? And oftentimes problems like this a visual can really go a fairly long way. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to say off to the side, kind of recreate as best you can a graph that might depict this information, go right ahead. For instance, f of three equaling zero. Well, that's just an ordered pair that I might denote here in blue that has the y, uh, I'm sorry, the x coordinate negative three and say a y coordinate of zero. So maybe that point would be located, oh, right around there. Um, and I know I didn't partition off the x axis. I really didn't want to because there's a lot of little marks I'd have to make to, to go out as far as nine and down as far as negative 12. But let's see if this makes sense. And then f of 9 being negative 12 would be a x value way out here at 9, and then a y value, whoa, even farther, way down there at the bottom of the screen, let's say. Let's say that that's the point 9, negative 12. And I'll go ahead and label these points. And all I, I know is that those two points have to be connected with some continuous curve. That curve can look like a lot of different things but it has to be continuous, no breaks, holes, or asymptotes. Well, it says which of the following statements is correct. So only one of these can be correct. So for instance, would f of 12 have to equal zero? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put an x about where I think that that point would be located. f of 12 equals zero would be, oh, somewhere maybe over here. And let's make that x purple. Does that have to be true? And the answer is no. It could be true, but you know what? We don't really know what's happening. And the reason we don't know what's happening is because we are really only living between the points negative 3 and 9 on the x-axis. Anything outside of those values are, are unknown to us. So we're going to say that the first one here does not have to be correct. Okay, what about part B? choice b negative 1 negative 13 well that would put this little x right oh uh, probably down there let me erase that so it's a little bit farther below and maybe i should scroll up a little bit so you can see it so it's a little farther below where the uh red dot is and it's at negative 1 for the x would we have to go through that point and the answer is no, we wouldn't. You know, we could still travel from this blue dot to that red dot without really ever going through that purple X. So I'm going to say no for him as well. Okay, well, we're running out of choices. So we go to choice C. F of negative 2 is negative 10. So if we look at this guy, we're going to go ahead and place the dot about where that would be. So negative 2 would be probably here, and then negative 10 would be maybe right, I don't know, right, right about there, let's say. Okay, could that be correct? Well, I do know that negative 2 does lie between both negative 3 and 9. Um, the y value of negative 10 lies between uh, 0 and negative 12. So I'm going to say right now that seems to be our best answer. That certainly could be correct. Now, I'm not saying that the graph has to go through that point, but it seems like it's the best answer so far. And then if I look at f of 8 equal 1, well, we have some problems with that because 8, 1 would be somewhere up there. And the issue is that the y value of that ordered pair, 1, 
is outside of the y value range that we have with our blue and our red dot, 0 to negative 12. So I'm going to stand a little bit more firm on the answer for C. C is the correct statement as far as relating to the existence of the intermediate value theorem. And the way that you would answer that is basically the x value is lying in between negative 3 and 9 at the same time that the y value lies in between 0 and negative 12. And it's the only point that has both of those characteristics. So that's one possible question uh, that relates to the intermediate value theorem as multiple choice. Example 2 is a little bit more open-ended response and it says use the intermediate value theorem to show that this polynomial function f of x equal x cubed plus 2x minus 1 has a 0 on the interval 0 to 1. Now the issue with this graphically is that it probably will bother most students to sketch f of x. And, and if it doesn't bother you, at least it will take a pretty inordinate amount of time to do a t-chart, to plot some points, and get an idea about what this function looks like. And you don't need to do that. What you need to do with this problem is understand what the idea of having a zero is all about. Right? A zero is just simply a fancy name for when a graph crosses the x-axis. Right? Sometimes they're called roots. Sometimes they're called solutions. So all you have to do is think of a zero as having the same meaning as the function being equal to zero. The y value is equal to zero. That's what y is when you're on the x-axis. So in order to guarantee that this polynomial function has that zero on the interval zero to one, basically what has to happen is that if you plug zero in for this polynomial and if you plug one in for the polynomial, you should see something happening with those two answers. Let's do that. So if we plug zero in, you don't have to be as meticulous as I am. Um, I'm doing this mainly for the purpose of the video. But you get negative one when you let x be zero. And if you let x be one, it looks like we're going to get two, I believe. That is the evidence we need. Okay. What is it about those two answers that tell us that zero is between them? One of them is positive and one of them is negative. Okay, now I want to get you kind of used to the idea of presenting this in the most efficient way possible. And what you're going to do is say, because f of x is continuous, aha, yep, we have to start with that. Now, how do we know that f of x is continuous? Well, we just know. I know that's not a great reason, but we do know. Anytime that you're dealing with a polynomial function, those are deemed to be continuous without proof. It's like a postulate. We accept it without proof. All polynomials are continuous. Sine of x is continuous. Cosine of x is continuous. E to the x are continuous. Those are the most common continuous functions that we're going to see. So because f of x is continuous and f of 0 is negative 1 and I know too many ands but that's okay we don't have to be grammatically correct f of 1 is 2 then we can say um, because f, because these things are true then f of x has a 0 we'll just say it like that again I don't know if that's grammatically correct either using then but Hey, it's not AP Lang, right? We're going to be okay with that. Um, and that's really all you would need. You need the component of mentioning the functions continuous and then mentioning the fact that your endpoints yielded a positive result and a negative result. Okay, we only have one more example left. We're going to bypass my little picture and then go to example three. This is a former advanced placement question from 2007. It's got a little bit of age on it, but still a good problem. Obviously, we're given a chart and we got some information here we'll read. It says the functions f and g are differentiable, differentiable for all real numbers, and g is strictly increasing. The table above gives the values of the functions and their first derivatives at selected values of x. The function h is given by uh, this particular guy. h of x is f of g of x minus 6, so a lot going on. And then I wrote a personal note. 
You guys have to understand that early on, as we try to give you former AP exam questions, these questions sometimes embed a lot of content from a lot of different units. And right now, really the only thing that you can be responsible for is unit one, especially if you're watching this video towards the beginning of your year. So the term differentiable is something that you're going to learn later. So don't worry about that. The functions that have these symbols f prime of x and g prime of x, again, they're concepts that are going to be taught later in unit two. They're not pertinent to the question that I'm giving you in part A. Okay, so I wanted you guys to keep that in mind. Um, those ideas are going to be required to answer s s perhaps other parts of the free response question. And the other thing, too, that I'm going to, to note here is that the function um, oh, uh, h is continuous. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make that proclamation right now. Okay, we're just going to say h of x is continuous. Now, you might ask, how do I know that? Well... It's coming up. <laughs> the fact that a function that uh, is made up of the composition of two functions that are differentiable means that your result will be continuous. We're going to learn that later. This will not be something that would appear on, say, the Unit 1 exam for you students at Avon High School because you don't know what differentiable is in Unit 1. We will probably just have to tell you that h of x is continuous. Okay? It never hurts to repeat that. So we know that h of x is continuous. Okay, so now what we need to do is figure out, well, what's h of 1? So much like the last problem, we'll figure h of 1. Let's figure out what's going on at that left endpoint. Well, to do that, we would go to the definition of h, and we would define that or evaluate that when x is 1. Now, what this is going to do, it's going to bring up a whole bunch of chart reading. You're going to have to go into the chart. First of all, find g of 1. g of 1 would be this number right here, 2. So we replace g of 1 with 2. And then now you got to go back to the chart. f of 2 is going to be 9. And then, of course, 9 minus 6 we know is 3. So kind of push that number off to the side. And now let's figure out what's happening on the other end at 3. h of 3 would be f of g of 3. So we go to the chart, find out what g of 3 is, which looks like it's 4. Now we have to figure out what f of 4 is, and that's negative 1. And of course, negative 1 minus 6 is negative 7. Now, what is it that we were looking for again? We wanted to see if h of r is going to be negative 5. Well, because negative 5 lies in between those two numbers, we know that this intervening value theorem works. Now the question is, how do you want to display that? I would do this. I would just simply say um, h of 1, which equals 3, is less than the negative 5, which is less than h of 3, which equals negative 7. Uh, let's do that backwards. <laughs> no, let's not write it like that. Doesn't make sense. I apologize. Let's start with h of 3. That's the smallest value, negative 7. That's less than our negative 5, which is less than h of 1, which is equal to the 3. And once you got all of that down, that is going to be a very crystal clear explanation. Now, to be honest, if, if, if this question were really going to be scrutinized on the AP exam, you probably would have to say something a little bit different instead of this. In fact, you'd have to say probably that because h of x is differentiable, it is also continuous. But again, I'm not worried about that for the purpose of unit one. I'm more concerned with you making sure that you evaluated those two endpoints at one and three and found two numbers that were smaller than and less uh, greater than this negative five. Okay. Um, the skill builder sheet that we have that accompanies this particular lesson, I think will do a pretty good job in giving you a variety of questions to really kind of see the intermediate value from some various angles. So, anyhow, I hope this works and we'll see you at the next video.